Travis Pennington Murphy watched the crowd of people enter the gym at Central Florida Community College. Looks like quite a few people showed up for the fifth reunion of the class of 2002. He decided to wait a little before entering. He was pretty sure Faith wouldn't be there. At least her Facebook post said she would be busy at a kindergarten event with her four-year-old's twins. He thought he recognized a few people, but at this distance it was difficult to be sure. Hey, people change in five years. Some change in a couple of weeks. Finally, he got out of the car and slowly walked towards the gym. Five years have passed since he was in his hometown. He spent the first 20 years of his life here, in this beautiful old southern city. Memories flashed through his head. The voice made him jump. Hey, Trav, is that you, buddy? Damn, Jack Burns, how are you doing? The two friends smiled and shook hands. Travis looked at the young woman standing next to his friend, Betty, Betty Owens, you look gorgeous, how are you? She's Betty Burns now, Trav. We have two kids and a third on the way. Look at you, Trav, oh my God, I'm so sorry, man. What happened? Hey, don't worry, things will get better in a couple of months. Betty, you look great, congratulations to you both, you're very lucky. Have you seen Tim or Frank lately? We see them often, they should both be here with their wives. Frank married Grace Herndon and Tim married Jane Stevenson. They will be very pleased to see you again. How long are you here for? Travis smiled. Yeah, I think I'm back for good this time. I just stopped by for a minute. I haven't even stopped by my mom's yet. Hey man, that's really cool. I'm so sorry about your dad. He was a truly wonderful man. He was always there for us when we were kids. Are you out of the Marines anymore? Almost. I'm on terminal leave. After three deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, I needed to be there to look after my mother. She was lost without my dad. By this time they entered the gym. People called him by name. There was applause and shouting. There was suddenly silence and Travis felt someone grab his arm and turn him sharply towards him. He was hit. The audience sighed as people got a better look at his once handsome face. The girl who hit him looked at him with her mouth open in shock and disbelief. Her hands covered her face. Oh my God, Trev, please forgive me, I didn't know. His face was strong excised on the left side, the skin was tight and bright red. A grimace appeared on the right side of his face as he said, Faith, I don't think I deserve this after all, it hurts more than when you left me. Her jaw dropped again. What? What? That's not true. You never called or wrote, except for some crazy note with congratulations on some occasion and wishes for a good and happy life. Travis looked at her. Hey, you sent me a wedding invitation with a stupid little note saying you're pregnant and marrying Alan Freed. You sent me a newspaper ad about your return from your honeymoon. You sent me an invitation to join your Facebook account. You posted pictures of the twins once a month or so. You left me, Mrs. Freed. The beautiful girl stood stunned. Are you crazy? I didn't do any of this. I'm not married and I don't have children. I see Alan from time to time, but I would never marry him. I was in love with you. Her mouth snapped shut. Her eyes narrowed. She screamed, Alan Freed, where are you? Someone shouted. Alan just ran out the back door. Faith stood looking at Travis. Her face softened, tears streaming down both cheeks. She stretched out her arms and walked towards the tall man, who looked down as her arms wrapped around his neck. She sobbed and raised her head to look at him. She kissed him. She looked into his eyes. Trev, it's all a lie. I never stopped loving you, not even for a minute. I still love you. I think about you several times a day. God must have heard me because I always pray to him to bring you back to me every time I think about you. They stood with their arms around each other, and then Travis looked around at the crowd around them. He looked into her eyes. Would you like to find a secluded place where we can talk for a while? She grabbed his hand and led him back to the exit. She led him to a car parked by the door. She pressed the button on the keys to unlock the doors. He opened the front passenger door. She said, no, sit in the back. It will be easier for us to talk. 
I need you to tell me again what happened when you left home five years ago. Okay, in a nutshell, while I was in Marine Corps training at Quantico, Virginia, a few weeks later I received an invitation to a wedding between you and Alan Freed that was to take place in three days. There was a note at the bottom saying you were very apologetic, but said she was pregnant with his child. Then, another month later, I received an email with a copy of a page from the Ocala Daily News announcing the return of you and your husband Alan. Frida from her month-long honeymoon in London, Paris and Rome. There was a photograph of you both. Then, about eight months later, I received a copy of the birth announcement of your twins. Then I received the notification that I had been added to the list of friends on your MyFace site. I signed up and could see new photos of you, your children and Alan when I want to. I admit that I watch it once a year. It's too painful. I can tell you that it's all a lie. The only person who had access to all these things was Alan. I will kill that bastard. I will crush him. Marry him. I would have died sooner. I was never with him. I can prove it. I've never had a man and my name is still Faith Hall. Travis smiled at her and then winced a little. I've never had a woman either. With a face like that, I'll probably always be alone. No, I don't believe it. You are such a wonderful person that every girl would want you. You? I'm bigger than everyone else. Will you kiss me again? Yes, any time. No, always. Faith heard Travis whisper the words she wanted to hear. He said, Faith, I thought my life was doomed to be very miserable for the rest of my life. I was dead inside for five years. I couldn't stand being around beautiful girls. They brought back memories I didn't want. I didn't really enjoy anything I did. I took distance learning courses all the time in college and earned four different degrees in business administration, marketing, accounting, and criminology. Criminology, Faith laughed. You. They didn't have many courses. I guess I could have chosen cosmetology. I could have become a cosmetologist. Faith kissed Travis again. Trev, let's go to my house. I don't feel comfortable in the car here. Okay, I need to stop by and see my mom. I tried calling, but she didn't answer. Darling, why don't you stay at my place for the night and call your mom tomorrow? Huh? Honey, your mom is only 49 and looks 35. She's beautiful. She dates a lot. About. Please don't be angry with her. She's still young. Angry at mom? No way. I'm very happy for her. I know she loved dad with all her heart, but he left three years ago. It's time for her to move on with her life. I know that's what dad would want for her. Travis followed Faith to the apartment complex. He tried to tell her that he would get a motel room for the night, but she wouldn't even listen. She said, I want to hear more about your life. I need to take a closer look at you and figure out what can be done for your face, and I won't go into a hotel with any man unless we're married. She helped him carry his bags to her apartment. He wasn't surprised to find that her apartment was neat and attractive, with nothing out of the ordinary. He saw his photograph prominently displayed. Nearby was a photograph of a young woman with two girls whom he recognized. He pointed to the little girls. Hey, those are your daughters. Faith looked at him. No, honey, these are my nieces, my sister Nancy's children. This is Nancy with them. Faith stomped her foot. I'll kill that bastard. They set his things down and Faith pulled him into the kitchen under the bright lights. She placed a chair and he sat on it. She carefully examined his face from all sides. She took a large magnifying glass from the drawer and looked at him for a long time and carefully touched his face. She smiled at him and pulled him onto the living room couch. She kissed his forehead tenderly. That's what I do. I take photographs and create preliminary sketches, measurements and diagrams from X-rays and CT scans that are used to plan facial reconstruction surgeries. Your face should be an easy case. Faith led him to the living room sofa. She sat down next to him and kissed him again. Travis Murphy, you don't take care of yourself at all. Looks like I'm going to have to take this into my own hands. I think your face can be repaired. We'll find out in a day or two. 
I can't believe they haven't done this yet. They plan to do it in a month, when I've healed a little. I need to go back to the Naval Hospital in Washington to do it. No, you're going to see the doctors I work with on Monday. They're some of the best in the world at facial reconstruction. They're husband and wife, and they work hard for the Department of Defense. I want you to be operated on correctly. Maybe I'll have to look at you for the rest of my life. Really? Are you serious? I think so. We need to get to know each other again. But for now, you seem to be the same guy I loved so much that I never looked at other men seriously for a long-term relationship. I feel the same way about you, Faith. I never thought about another woman. It's true. I admit I looked at a few, but they weren't what I was looking for. Travis, I have to admit that I've been expecting you for a while now. Please don't tell Mom I told you but we talk almost every day, and she hinted that she was sure you'd be home before the summer. She also told me that she thinks you still love me. She says you refuse to talk bad about me or get angry with me. You never told her what happened between us. We couldn't figure it out. I love your mom very much, Trev. I think of her as my best friend. We both love you very much. I didn't know you knew each other so well. We both know one thing. We need you in our lives. Travis kissed Faith. Faith stood up and said, smiling, I'm going to change into something more comfortable. Why don't you change into shorts or something? Trev opened his smaller bag and found a pair of gym shorts and a tight T-shirt. He changed his clothes and turned to see Faith leaning in the doorway, smiling. About, stop, I just remembered something. Travis jumped up and went to his bag. He opened it and took out something, then put the bag back in the bag. He sat down next to Faith and took her hand, holding it tenderly. He looked again into her eyes. Then he said quietly, Girl, I love you with all my heart. I wore this for five years. I wanted to throw it away many times, but I could never do it. I bought this little ring because I was going to propose to you next time. I'll see you. Will you accept it, albeit belatedly? She stared at him, tears streaming down her cheeks, but she didn't hesitate for a second. Yes, yes, my love, I will accept this ring and promise to be faithful to you. I will marry you, Travis P. Murphy. She laughed a little and looked at him. Oh, honey, I forgot what the letter P stands for. Pennington, honey, Pennington. That's mom's maiden name. Oh, I know that name. That name is very familiar because I work in the Pennington building downtown. Mr. Penn Pennington died a few months ago. A certain young man took it over. Looks like he'll be here soon. I know a lot of girls who work for them. Everyone who works for Pennington's company is wondering what will happen next. Nobody knows anything about this guy. You know, I... Yes, you are. I do not know anyone. Her eyes widened. You? Travis nodded. I inherited it from my uncle, my mother's brother. I came to do business. Do you know Alan works there? Travis grinned. It wasn't a happy smile. No, I didn't know. Does he have a good job? Yes, honey. He's always bragging about what a great job he has. He loves his job. Memph. Ouch. Faith found it difficult to speak when Travis kissed her. Wait, honey, let's move this to my bed, okay? She jumped up and ran to her bed. She looked back and saw that Travis Murphy was right behind her. Faith stopped by the bed and looked at him as she took off her shorts. Honey, take off your clothes now. She smiled when she saw Travis completely naked for the first time. Her first thought was that she was grateful to God that there were only a few small scars on his arms and shoulders. They made love. They dozed for some time. Travis woke up to Faith smiling and bubbling with happiness. She was talking to someone on the phone. Yes, I know he's in town. Yes, Mom Murphy, I saw him. He is okay. Do you want to talk to him? Yes, he is in my bed. Mom, we are in love again. Yes, we did it. Do you want him to call you in the morning? Wait, no, I don't want you to see him until I can talk to you. There's something you need to know first. Sandy's mom, get ready. He's a little. He spent the last three weeks in the hospital, mainly the left side of the face. 
It's just terrible. He's not in any danger. Faith looked at Travis. Yes, Sandy, I love him more than ever, and you know what? He put a ring on my finger. We're going to get married. Trev heard his mother screaming with joy on the phone. Faith giggled. I have to go, Mommy Murph. I'll call you tomorrow. Travis said, Good night, Mommy. I love you. Think about your wedding soon. Then he heard the phone turn off. Faith, just one word of caution. We belong exclusively to each other. No cheating. So if that's not what you want, let's just remain friends. Fine. Faith said, Maybe you don't trust me enough to know that even if I went out with another man for recreational sex, I would always come home to you. Love wouldn't come into it. Do you love me enough to allow me to satisfy my purely sexual desires with other people? I'll have to think about this for a while before we get married. Will you let me date other girls? Heck no. It would just kill me, wondering if she was better than me and if you were going to fall in love with her. No, Travis P. No, no, no. The children and I will not tolerate this. No, never. Are you saying that you can do it, but I can't? Trev, honey, you know that I'm teasing. Why get married then? The fact that diseases are now so common that this is a stupid way to act. Do we agree with this? Yes, no need to think. Honey, maybe after we've been married for a few years things will change, and we might want to change the rules, then we can talk about it, since we're strictly monogamous now, okay? I like it. I want only you. I think 30 years is too early. Travis, don't worry about it. Get back to the matter at hand. Make love to me, please. In the morning, Faith called Travis' mother, and she and Travis went to his mother's for brunch. Now she lives in a very beautiful apartment with a wonderful view of the embankment of a beautiful lake. His jaw dropped when he saw his mother. She was truly beautiful. She was wearing a casual outfit, jeans tucked into stiletto boots and a tight-knit blouse. Her stomach was flat and her ass was nice. She rushed to Travis and carefully examined his wounded face. Tears streamed down her cheeks and she cried, hugging him tightly. They hugged for a few moments, then Sandy Murphy turned to Faith and hugged and kissed her too. Sandy looked at Faith. Sweetheart, are you sure his cute face will be okay? Yes, dear Sandy, you know the work my doctors do. I just know that he will be his old self as soon as possible. Trev said, Damn, I thought they could make me look like Brad Pitt or something. Faith screamed, No way, you looked a lot better than him. Don't you agree, Sandy's mom? Of course I was. About Trev, honey, I almost forgot. A very nice gentleman called you, a certain Colonel Bradley. We talked for almost an hour. He loved you very much and was worried about you, very glad to hear that you are back with Faith. He didn't really say much at first, but opened up to me as we got to know each other a little better. He said he saw my picture in your things many times and thought I was your girlfriend. Mom, Colonel Bradley is a very good man. He was my regimental commander. We were wounded by the same hand grenade in Afghanistan. Oh, I know, dear, he told me. He should call back at any moment. He has no family, so please invite him to stay with us until he has to return. I want to meet him. Faith looked at Travis. She looked at Sandy, then back at Trav. Why didn't you tell me all this? Why didn't you tell me that you were a hero? Travis replied, Oh, I'm not a hero. I just did what I had to do. Marines never leave their own behind, ever. He's a widower, isn't he? Sandy asked. Yes, Mom, and he's a big, strong naval colonel, but I saw him cry for his men who were wounded, and he was very upset when his wife died after finding out that she cheated on him when she died with her lover in a car accident. He took it very hard. He didn't even go home. He let their adult daughters handle it. Sometimes I think he doesn't care if he dies, but I know he would never put his people in danger unnecessarily. Oh, poor man, Sandy and Faith said in unison. They looked at each other and tears flowed. They wiped their eyes with napkins and saved their makeup. Travis was very proud of these two beautiful and caring women whom he loved more than anything in the world, including his own life. 
The phone rang, and since Faith was the closest, Sandy asked her to answer it. She said, Good morning, this is the Murphy residence. Who's calling, please? Oh, yes, Colonel Bradley, Mrs. Ray Murphy just mentioned you. Would you like to talk to her? She smiled. Yes, sir, here she is. Faith took Travis's hand. Let's go to the kitchen and get some coffee. What? Honey, give Mom some privacy while she talks to him. She's more excited about this conversation than I've ever seen her. Is she interested in him? Why not? She's never even met or seen him. I have a few pictures of him on my little camera. He pulled out a small Olympus Stylus 700 camera from his jacket pocket. Travis took the camera out of its case and turned it on. He switched the camera settings to view images. He scrolled through the photos to the ones from a few days ago, where both of them were in full-dress uniform. Both were tall, handsome men. The colonel had gold piping on the visor of his cap, and his chest was strewn with medals. The next photo was of just Travis, followed by another close-up of the colonel, and then a photo of the colonel in camouflage holding a can of Bud Light. There were many photographs of Marines she did not recognize. Travis tried to hide one photo from Faith, but she wouldn't let him. Faith grabbed the camera from Travis and ran into the living room. She showed a photograph of Colonel Sandy. She laughed into the phone. Oh, Hank, I see a picture of an older man in uniform with my son. Is that you? Wow, you look very handsome, like a Marine Corps recruiting poster. What's the next shot? Oh, close up of your face. You have a nice smile, Hank. Oh, my God. Isn't it, Trav? It was a shock. Then, Hank, let me know when you land and where, and I'll meet your plane. I'm a nurse, so bring your medical documents with you so I can take care of you. Looking forward to seeing you too, Hank, hurry up. She turned and looked at her son, then hurried towards him and carefully examined his face. Her lips trembled, and she clenched her teeth. She looked at Faith. I will accept your damage analysis. Faith. I want to be there to hear what they have to say, Ian and David after x-rays and a thorough examination. Sandy took Faith's hand. Did you look at his cute ass last night? Is there a lot of good meat and leather to work with? An hour later, the three of them were discussing going out to lunch when the phone rang again. Sandy replied. Her face lit up with a charming smile. Hey Hank, were you able to book the flight? About. You did it, didn't you? Is it great that it's so soon? About. Faith will be with him. Fine. Yes, he can take us to MacDill Air Force Base. Yes, based on operations. We'll be there, Hank. Can't wait to meet you. All three arrived a few minutes early and were parked in front of the temporary operations office when a Marine TFA-18 pulled up and parked in front of the building. Ten minutes later, a large Marine officer emerged from the building, Travis was also in uniform and saluted the colonel when they met. When the greeting was completed, the colonel, grinning widely, grabbed and shook the captain's hand. Trev, you look good, son. Travis introduced everyone. Faith and Sandy hugged and kissed the handsome Marine. He looked at the two women and then at Travis. You were right. They're both amazing. None of these girls can be your mother. Trev smirked. See... I told you he was an older flirt. Although he is harmless, ignore him, and he will probably go away. Sandy smiled. Honey, remember that your mother is old too, but I can still give you a slap you'll remember for a long time. I thought I taught you better manners. She took the colonel by the arm and headed towards the car. The large marine limped noticeably and used a cane for support. He kept his smiling eyes on Sandy. Faith helped Travis with the colonel's bags, and they placed them in the trunk of Sandy's car. Faith watched Travis carefully. She noticed a flicker of pain on his face every now and then. As Travis walked her to the front passenger side door of the car, she asked, Honey, are you okay? You look like you're in pain. Do you want me to drive? She put her hand on his forehead. He was very hot. Sandy, Trav has a fever. He's hot. Faith held him tightly as Sandy rushed to help. They helped him into the passenger seat. Sandy felt her son's head. She looked serious. We need to take him to the base's emergency room. Faith looked around. 
then ran back to the transit operations office. A moment later, an ambulance pulled up and Faith pointed to the vehicle. The ambulance crew quickly placed the young Marine captain on a stretcher and examined him. Colonel Bradley told the Emps that Travis was recovering from his injuries and the occasional infection could result from an undetected shrapnel. He suggested that doctors check the medical records at the Naval Hospital in Bethesda, Maryland. Faith and Sandy held each other, crying as paramedics checked Travis' vital signs. Sandy, Faith, and the colonel followed the ambulance to the base hospital emergency room and waited in the waiting room. Shortly after their arrival, an Air Force colonel entered the room. He wanted to know how he could help. Colonel Bradley explained the situation and mentioned that a young Marine captain had been recommended for the Congressional Medal of Honor for actions during which he was wounded in Afghanistan. The Air Force colonel looked at the people behind the counter. I want the duty officer to come here as soon as possible, please. The Air Force major quickly came out and saluted the colonels. Yes, sir, how can I help? The Air Force colonel explained the situation and requested a status report on the Marine captain as soon as possible. The Air Force colonel looked at the Navy colonel and said, Colonel, you don't look good either. Is everything okay? Sandy chimed in, Colonel Bradley was wounded in the same battle as my son, the captain, and came here to rest and recuperate with our family. You could check him out, but I think he was just overworked. The Air Force colonel nodded to the major. The major walked up to the counter, and a minute later a wheeled chair appeared and the colonel was wheeled away. Sandy asked if they could accompany the colonel and captain, saying that she and Faith were nurses. The colonel looked at the major, who smiled and told the ladies to follow him. Both Marines were placed in the same room. The girls approached Travis. The doctor who was with Travis smiled as he looked at the Marine lying on the gurney. Well, now I understand why Marines are always smiling. Ladies, let me assure you, the captain is fine. We found a very small piece of foreign matter in the wound. There's probably a piece of his uniform on his shoulder. It was infected, and we removed the object. We put some antibiotics on the wound, gave him an injection, and we'll put a bandage on it soon, so he can go. The doctor examining Colonel Bradley said, The colonel is just too tired. I'm surprised he can even walk with all his wounds. Sandy hurried to the colonel and kissed him lightly. I'm a nurse. I'll make sure he's well rested. The major said, Ma'am, if you promise to keep an eye on him, we can also release the captain. Now we are confident that we have removed the problem, and we have filled him with antibiotics. Keep an eye on his temperature, he should be fine. Feel free to bring them back if you deem it necessary. Everyone returned to Sandy's condo in less than two hours. Travis felt much better and wanted to spend all his time with Faith, and she didn't seem to mind. Sandy and the colonel sat in the living room talking, both struggling with their sexual urges. They both knew they would give up before the end of the night. Sandy heard Travis and Faith talking quietly, then there was silence. There was a knock on the door from the living room to the office. Sandy said, yes. Faith responded, Sandy's mom, Travis and I are going to go to my house so I can show him some videos of what happened while he was gone. That's good, honey. Why don't you stay the night? I'm going to put Hank to bed early so he can get a good rest. That sounds medically correct. I think I'll do the same for Travis. I'll make sure he takes his meds and goes to bed early. Good night, everyone. Sandy and Hank heard the young couple leave and looked at each other, smiling. Sandy said, I just don't know how to tell them that we've been dating for almost 18 months now, on and off. I can't tell Travis that I contacted you through the Marine Corps because I was worried about him. Sandy, I thank God every day that you did this to find out how Travis is coping with Faith's letter to John and his father's death. I could never have been as bold and direct with you in a private conversation as I have been. I was in emails after we exchanged thoughts for weeks. I would be absolutely stunned by your beauty when I saw you. I could never believe that you drove eight or nine hours to meet me and spend the weekend with a beat-up old Marine. Sandy laughed. You, stutterer, I don't believe it, not you. 
I know that you are truly a very caring and sweet person. You are a very gentle and attentive lover. I love the way you love me. No, I just love you. Everything is about you, dear. I'm dying to be in your arms again. Besides, I wasn't the only one who drove. You left here on Sunday at 6 or 7 in the evening and were at work in Camp Legend on Monday morning at 5 o'clock. You did this almost every two weeks. Yes, I walked through that door many Saturday mornings at 5 o'clock and left on Sunday nights at 7. It was worth it. We spent almost two days in bed. It was hard when Travis and I went to Afghanistan for nine months. I was overjoyed when Travis and I were injured and came home early, although we could have done without all that time in the hospitals. Sandy looked at him seriously. Hank, I can't live like this anymore. We have to tell Travis the truth about us. I'm begging you to marry me. I need to be with you all the time, every night. Hey, honey, I'm the one who begged you to marry me. You kept saying no. We're almost too late, but I'd really like to have a baby with you. Are you sure, darling, that I won't put you in any way in danger? Oh, they say my body is as fit, flexible, and childbearing as any 35-year-old healthy woman. She laughed. You're robbing the cradle, old man. Later, Faith and Travis were lying on her couch. Trev said, I wonder how my mom and Hank get along. I have a feeling that they know each other much better than is possible. So quickly, I noticed a lot of sneaky feelings and touching. What do you think? You're joking, of course. They are like that. They just don't know how to tell you about it. Why not? I think it's great. Colonel Hank is my hero, and I admire and respect him. He is a true gentleman in every aspect of the word. Faith giggled. I know your mom loves him. They've been dating for over a year. She went behind your back and met with him to see how you were doing after your father died and you left me, and then cried her heart out about it. Trev sat down. Did you know all this? No, I didn't know you were crying about me until recently when Hank asked your mom who Faith was because after you got shot, you cried yourself to sleep every night because of Faith. How long have you been talking to your mom? About a couple of months after you wrote me that card. We still don't understand what this means. I love your mom, and she loves me. We both love you. Wow, I never knew they were that close. Do you think they will get married? Yes, I wouldn't be surprised by a double wedding with you. Travis looked at Faith. Will you marry me? Yes, my dear man, I love you with all my heart. Do you think they are still awake? It's only nine o'clock in the evening. They're probably not sleeping yet. Why? Travis smiled and dialed the number he knew by heart. Hi, Mom. How are you guys doing? I'm glad you two are still awake. Faith and I are planning something for our wedding, and we need to know if you'll be there. Great, but we're not going to be the matron of honor. No, Mom, we want you to be the bride. We want you and Hank to have a double wedding. You will do this? Wonderful, Mom. I think Faith wants to talk to you. Mama Sandy, I didn't say anything. Travis figured it out on his own. Your boy realized it right after Hank arrived. You were too friendly, too quickly. Travis said, Mom, we all need to get together and figure this out. No more secrets, okay? Yes, son, I completely agree. I made a huge mistake, and I need to fix it as soon as possible. I love Hank, and he loves me. We want to get married as soon as possible. Travis said, Mom, if the colonel agrees, we'll let you and Faith plan the wedding. We'll do everything we can to help prepare for the double wedding. On Monday morning, Travis accompanied Faith to work. He was in civilian clothes and met doctors Janet and David Carr. They were both very attractive and in their mid-forties. Travis liked them, they were friendly, and it was clear that they really liked Faith. Dr. Bezjan noticed the ring on Faith's finger, and both doctors were clearly happy for Faith and congratulated them both. The nurses, receptionists, and all the assistants gathered around Faith and Travis to wish them well. Travis was x-rayed, and then Faith took a series of pictures of his face from different angles. She loaded the results into the computer and overlaid a grid on the photographs. 
The doctors examined his face and dictated a large number of measurements and degrees, most of which Travis did not understand. Faith followed the doctors into their office, telling Travis, I'll be right back, honey. Faith came out and explained that she needed to work with the information received and prepare a computer model of his head and face that the doctors would use when planning procedures. Afterwards, they will examine his entire body to see what they have to work with. She said they would see him again in a couple of hours. Travis told Faith that he was going to hang out and see the Pennington Company. He left the office and found a sign indicating that the Pennington Company's executive offices were on the top floor. He took the elevator and found himself in a large reception hall. There was a large table in front of him. A very attractive young woman smiled at him. Can I help you with something, sir? Yes, I would like to meet Mr. Brandt, please. Are you expected, sir? I don't see any appointments right now. No, I don't have an appointment. Tell Mr. Brandt that Mr. Murphy wants to see him. Travis P. Murphy. Yes, sir, Mr. Murphy, take a seat there, and I will see if Mr. Brandt is available at the moment. Travis remained in front of the counter. The girl turned her back to Travis while she was talking on the phone, then turned back in her chair and said, Mr. Brandt is very busy right now. Please take a seat. He should be free in an hour or so. Perhaps if you indicate your business to Mr. Brandt, this will help. Tell Mr. Brandt that the P in my name stands for Pennington. Tell him I'm here to see if he'll be working tomorrow. The girl's jaw dropped, and she said, Yes, sir, Mr. Bed Murphy. She pressed a button on her phone and repeated the message he had given her. She looked at him carefully as she listened. She covered the microphone with her hand, smiled, and whispered, I'm talking to his secretary. Travis smiled at her and winked. A moment later, a short, plump, balding man burst out of the door and quickly walked up to Travis, extending his hand. Nice to see you, Mr. Pace Murphy. I'm Gordon Brandt, CEO. I wasn't expecting you today, sir. Would you like to come into my office, sir? Travis looked at him coldly. Thank you, Mr. Brandt. Firstly, please ask this young lady to indicate the right person to issue me a badge with the same name that my uncle used. Thank you. They left, and Travis turned to the receptionist. Miss, do you know Faith Hall, who works at Dr. Kai's car on the first floor? Yes, sir, I know her very well. Her hand flew to her mouth. Oh, my God, you're Travis Faith. Wow, she smiled and said, this girl is crazy about you. I can't believe you're back. Travis smiled. I'm back. Call and tell her where she can find me when she's ready. She might want to tell you some good news. He was still smiling when he turned and followed Brandt into the luxurious office. On the door hung a large brass sign that read, Gordon Brandt, Chief Operating Officer, Pennington Company. Travis looked around. It was a very cozy office, with a good view of the city, large leather furniture, and a huge desk. Mr. Brothers Brandt was sitting at the table and said, Please make yourself comfortable, Mr. Murphy. We were not expecting you so soon. We have been informed that you are in the Marine Corps. That's right, Mr. Brandt. I'm here for a few weeks before returning to Washington, D.C., for an indefinite period. While I'm here, I would like to be permanently assigned to the office of Mr. Pennington, secretary and personal assistant. Ah, uh, yes, sir, it was Mr. Pennington's office. Very well, that will do. What was your rank before Mr. Pennington died? I was the CEO. He was the president of the company. Okay, now you will become the CEO again and continue to manage the company. I am not yet fully familiar with all the company's activities. I know that I am the sole owner and you answer directly to me, right? Yes, sir. My uncle highly valued your management abilities. I will act on the recommendations he left me in the letter I recently received. I do not see any major changes in your work in the foreseeable future. A change in your title at this time will not affect your salary fee. However, I expect you to consult with me on any major acquisitions or policy changes before they are implemented. 
My uncle trusted you absolutely and advised me to do the same if I decided that I was not suitable for the position of president, you would replace me. Me and I will retire and enjoy the profits. Now we have Mr. Alan Freed at work, right? Yes, Mr. Murphy, he is the administrative assistant to our director of operations in the real estate section. Great, make him my personal assistant, okay? No problem, sir. Travis stood up and smiled at Mr. B Brandt. Gordon, I think we'll get along well together. Please understand that I only expect the truth from you. I absolutely don't need someone who will always agree with me, okay? Gordon smiled. Of course, boss, you will always get the unvarnished truth. Travis smiled back. I think I have an appointment with Dr. Kajankar and Dr. Tefokar soon. I will contact you later today. Can you arrange a secretary and my personal assistant within a few hours? Yes, sir. It will be done. Your office will be ready by then. Great. Travis walked into the doctor's office and asked for Faith. The receptionist pressed a button and said, He's here, honey. Travis heard the door open behind him, and when he turned around, he saw her. Come in. The doctors are ready to talk to you. She led him into a large office. Both doctors met him and shook his hand. Dr. Bill and Dave said, Mr. Proud Murphy, we haven't had a chance to tell you that we are really pleased to finally meet you. We know your mom well, and of course we know and love Faith. We feel like we know you because we always talk about you, Sandy and Faith say. Your mom should be here in a minute with her fiancé. We'll wait for them if you don't mind. We contacted Bethesda Naval Hospital and received your medical records. The Department of Defense has agreed to pay for our services as your primary care physicians, so you will only need to return to Washington for special events when you officially retire. We love it because we usually have to travel to work with wounded military personnel. We have found that your recovery is much faster if you are at home. We do this for free as our way of saying thank you to our wounded who sacrificed so much for their country. Dr. Jan smiled. Faith would have left if we hadn't done this. We couldn't lose Faith. We feel like you're part of our family too, Travis. Just to put your mind at ease, we think we can make you new again. Any scars should fade quickly. We don't see any problems we can't handle, okay? Travis looked at Faith. What do you think? About Trev, you know that I thought so from the very beginning. I want only the best for you. I will have to look at this and kiss this every day for the rest of my life. Darling, I have seen faces so terrible that I almost felt sick just looking at them and working on them, like I worked on you this morning. Then to see them a month or so later, and there's no trace of what they looked like before, it's so touching and I really love what we're doing here. Sandy Murphy and Colonel Hank were brought into the room and Carr's team explained the entire situation to all of them. Everyone was happy. As they were leaving, Travis said, Dr. D Dave, can I pick Faith up for an hour or so? I want to show her my new office upstairs. Everyone looked at him. He smiled. I inherited this building and the Pennington Company when my mom's uncle died. I promise not to raise your rent. Wow. Faith, girl, my goddess, you're going to be rich, aren't you? Doctor, Jan said. Faith looked at her lover. I never thought about it. Can I still work here? Of course, but you also have to do your homework. She thought for a second. Okay, I can do it. Travis hugged her. Sweetheart, you can work here as long as you want. We will be partners in our marriage. We will decide what you want to do. As long as you spend every night in bed with me. Travis, I have nowhere else to go. As they rode up in the elevator, Sandy said, Son, did you know there is a private elevator from the parking lot to your private office? No, really? Yes, and I have an access card to it too. Travis turned to Faith. Guess who's my admin? Assistant. Really, Alan? Travis smiled. Yeah, Mr. Freed has a new boss. Who would you recommend for the secretary position? For you. Not for Alan. My good friend Sally Burns, she is beautiful, wonderful, intelligent, and very efficient. All the girls say she is the best. 
beautiful. Oh yeah, did I mention she's very, very married? She's 45 years old, tall, about six feet, has four kids, and a huge husband who dwarfs her, and she absolutely adores him. T. Ravis laughed. She sounds perfect to me. They entered the main reception area, and the receptionist rushed to hug Faith. She smiled at Travis. Mr. Murphy, your office is ready. Mrs. Burns is inside cleaning up for you, sir. Your new sign will be ready tomorrow. Travis smiled. Take your time. He looked at her badge. Megan O'Day, hmm, we Mexicans have to take care of each other, right? The girl laughed and said, See, Senor, that's for sure. Travis turned and walked into the office. The woman who greeted him with a huge smile was well under six feet. She was wearing very high heels and seemed only about five two in her shoes. She was very attractive and wore a badge that said Mrs. Sally Burns. Travis walked up to her and extended his hand, looking far above her head. She took his hand and looked at Faith, hinting, Is he blind? Faith bent over laughing, No, I told him you were six feet tall, he's trying to prove me wrong. Everyone was introduced to each other, and everyone was talking when Alan Freed quietly entered the office and walked up to the wall. Travis noticed him and stared at him for a moment, then whispered in Faith's ear, Honey, just ignore Alan, don't pay him any attention. He looked at Mrs. F Burns. Miss Sally, I have a task for you. I want you to compile me a directory that will tell me everything I need to know about this company and how it operates. It will be for my eyes only. I want a description, from your point of view, of all the leaders of the various departments, divisions, and units of this company. Tell me about the scope of their responsibilities and your opinion of their work. I want you to send a request to each of the company's leaders to submit a similar report on all other leaders. Do you understand what I want? Yes, sir, I understand exactly. I already have the first section almost ready. Mr. Brothers Brandt told me a month ago to prepare such a document. However, it did not contain the assessments of the managers. Great, one more thing. Send out a form in which each company secretary will rate each executive anonymously on a scale of 1 to 10. Got it. Mrs. Sally smiled. Yes, Mr. Murphy, I think I understand. It won't be a problem. Great. What I just requested could greatly influence my decisions regarding the company. I hope everyone here understands that this could affect many lives. I may decide to close any parts that are not profitable or perhaps all I want. The truth is, my current feeling is that the company is well managed, and there will be no changes needed in the near future other than getting rid of some ineffective elements. He turned his head and looked straight at Alan Freed. Everything I said in this room remains strictly confidential. Besides, I inherited three houses, some nice cars, several yachts, planes, and a lot of money. I really don't need a headache. Everyone stared at Travis. He smiled widely and said, Well, I need some time to play with my new toys, he hugged Faith, especially with this one. Travis pulled away and looked at Sally Burns. Do we have a place where I can meet and talk to all of our employees at the same time? She smiled. Yes, sir, we have an auditorium in this building that can accommodate all the workers in this area. Okay, set up a meeting for everyone on Friday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Find out how long it will take to get everyone in the room, and when everything will need to stop so they can get there on time. If there are any transportation problems, solve them. He looked at Freed. You take care of it. He turned to Sally. Madam, please notify Mr. Brandt as soon as I leave, only about the meeting so he can adjust his schedule. Don't tell anyone else about anything else that happened here. Is this doable, Mrs. Burns? Yes, Mr. Murphy, it's doable. Travis looked around, looked at his family and said, Come on, I need a rest. Sally said, Mr. Murphy, sir, would you like your chauffeur to pick you up in a limousine when you are ready to come again? Travis smiled. Thank you, Mrs. Burns. I'll call you if I need to. Sir, you need to carry this satellite phone with you at all times. All the important numbers are already programmed in it. 
you can contact any place in the world where there is a telephone connection. Thank you, Mrs. G. Burns. This will come in handy. Sir, please call me Sally. I'll feel more comfortable that way. Sally, I appreciate it. You can call me whatever you want. My fiancé loves you very much. Sally smiled. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. The four left the company headquarters, Faith returned to work, and Travis, Sandy, and Hank got into Sandy's car when Travis' cell phone rang. It was Faith. She said Carr's doctors had given her the rest of the day off and that she needed a ride home. Travis looked towards the front door and saw her just leaving. He drove up and picked her up. He smiled as she sat down next to him and kissed him sweetly. He told her they were going to see Travis' new house on the river. This was Faith and Hank's first visit. Travis and his mother had been there many times. The estate was very beautiful. Hundreds of azaleas were in bloom. Some of the huge flower beds were different shades of pink. Others were white and red. Several azalea bushes were trimmed into large ball shapes and looked great. All landscaping work was impeccable. The house was very large, but at the same time cozy and comfortable. They were greeted by the entire staff of twelve who took care of the place. Travis happily greeted them all like old friends. Sandy knew everyone too. There was a lot of hugging and kissing. Many of the staff shed tears over Travis' condition. Dwight, the head majordomo, a distinguished senior man, took Travis aside when everything had calmed down and said, Mr. Travis, welcome to your new home, sir. I hope we can expect you here soon. Everything here is done as perfectly as only we can. Everyone here is looking forward to your arrival, sir. Travis responded, Dwight, while there's still a lot of uncertainty for me, just a moment, please. Travis beckoned Faith over. Dwight, let me introduce Miss Faith Hall. Faith is my fiancé. We are getting married soon. Dwight bowed and with a wide smile took her hand and kissed the back of it. Miss Faith, I am very, very pleased to meet you. I have known Mr. Dej Travis since he was born. He is a fine young gentleman. You should be very proud of him. I'm very proud of Travis. He's my hero. It's nice to meet you. You can tell me about all the pranks he got up to as a kid. Dwight smiled. Miss Faith, I hope I live to see the day when I hear the laughter of children in this house again. Faith squeezed the old man's hand. She smiled. I guess you won't have to wait too long. Sandy and Hank joined them. Sandy hugged Dwight and introduced Hank as her fiancé. The senior majordomo congratulated her and said that he was very happy for her and that she was too young and beautiful to be alone. He said, May I assign a room for your guests, Miss Sandy? Yes, Dwight, that would be great. If my son doesn't mind, he's the master of this house now. Yes, ma'am, he certainly is. He turned to Travis. Sir, everything is ready for you this afternoon if you wish, sir. Would you like the Cadillac convertible to be made available for your use, sir? Yes, Dwight, that will be good. You can expect Miss Faith and I to be here tonight and for the near future. Travis looked at Faith. She smiled and nodded. Travis smiled at his mother. Mom, would you and Hank like to join us here for dinner tonight? Sandy looked at Hank, who smiled and nodded. She said they would be welcome and would probably stay the night. Travis looked at Dwight. Is it too late for BBQ chicken for dinner tonight? Dwight smiled. Good choice, sir. Let me check. He walked over to the wall telephone and talked for a minute. He returned smiling. Sir, she has fresh ribs in stock and just enough time to cook them if dinner is at eight. Great. Cocktails at seven, dinner at eight, casual attire, don't want to get barbecue sauce on my tux. Travis looked at Dwight. The pool deck would be nice, I think. Very good, sir. Later in the evening, the two couples chatted quietly in the jacuzzi on the pool deck. Hank smiled. Can we visit you often? I could get used to it. It's a lot different from Afghanistan, isn't it? Yes, Colonel, that's for sure. The food here is much better, and hugging Faith is better than the cold boulders there. No one fired at me today. Not a single rocket or grenade came my way. I'm going to get used to it when I stop flinching. 
Every time I hear a loud sound, then I'll think about going outside. I remember Uncle Paul had a cute little cabin on stilts in the Keys. We're going to be there a lot. Faith said, I think I'm going to have to reconsider my priorities. It's going to be hard for me to get up for work every morning and leave Travis to sleep in our warm bed. It's going to be hard for me to go to work when Travis wants to go fishing in the Keys. I love my job. But I think it will be my full-time job to take care of Travis properly. I think I'll hand in my resignation tomorrow if we don't need the money. Travis smiled. I think we can manage without your salary. My marine pension payments should make up for that. I don't want to wake up in the morning, reach out to you, and find you gone to work. I firmly believe that I will need your help in managing the company. I don't know anything about running a business. Of course, you know as much as I do, and it's not that much. Most of it can be boiled down to common sense, and you have plenty of that. Of course, it helps that I have a degree in business and marketing. I also need you to help me stay calm. Don't let me become arrogant because I run a big company. I don't deserve it. I just inherited it. Anyone can do it. Don't worry about it. I'll remind you that the office boy puts on his pants just like you, one leg after the other. Now I want to go up and try that huge bed in our rooms. It has to be the biggest bed I've ever seen you. I'm afraid I'll lose you there and never find you. If I lose you, I'll turn on the light and find you. Travis looked at her seriously. I always thought a queen bed was big enough for normal people to do what normal people do. Faith smiled. My bed in my apartment is a queen bed. Was it big enough for you, dear? Perfect. It suits me. Let's try her. If we don't like it, we can always switch with Mom and Hank. Old people only need to find each other once every couple of months. Hank laughed. If you think so, then your mom and I must be very young. I don't know about that, sir. You don't look all that agile limping around with your cane. I looked a lot quicker than you when they brought you to the hospital on a stretcher the other day. Touché, we look rather sad as grooms-to-be. We'll probably need some help on our wedding night. Sandy laughed. For some reason, I have a feeling both of you will perform brilliantly that night. Right, Faith? Yes, Sandy's mom. Why shouldn't this night be different than any other? Travis read the company report that Sally wrote for him. He was very pleased. Sally and Alan sat while he read. He asked Sally a few questions. Her answers cleared up some things he wasn't sure about. The bell on his desk rang, and Sally pressed the button and listened to the phone, then said, Yes, let him come in. She looked at Travis. Miss Hall is here, sir. The office door opened and Faith walked in. She looked around and said, If you're busy, honey, I can come back later. Travis looked at Alan. No, honey, sit next to me, Mr. Freed. Please bring a chair for Miss Hall and place it next to me. Travis stood up and helped her sit before kissing her. We just finished talking about the company and are about to move on to the personnel. Let's continue, Sally. Sally read a very detailed report on each executive in the company. She spoke about the education and previous experiences of each of them. She laid out the story of each person in the company. She told Travis that Mr. Pennington used a system of semi-annual performance reports for each employee, which were completed by their supervisors. This made it easier for her to report on each employee. They reviewed the records of each vice president and his top aides. Travis was unimpressed with the vice president of transportation, and the department was facing recurring problems in many areas. Travis looked at Alan. Mr. Freed, what's the problem in the transportation department? I don't know, sir. Mr. Bo Freed, this is not an acceptable answer. When your boss asks you, he is not interested in your knowledge. He expects you to provide the information requested. There is only one correct answer to this question, and that is, I will find out, sir. Do you understand, Mr. Freed? Yes, sir, I understand. I am inquiring about the transportation department, sir. Very well, Mr. Freed. Use tact and try to get the information without alerting everyone that they are under investigation. Yes, sir. Freed turned and left the office. 
Sally smiled at Travis. Wow, boss, you told him off very politely. Travis smiled back. He separated Faith and I for five years and made my life hell the entire time. I'll end up making his life hell too. Find out what you can about his love life if you can. I'm pretty sure he doesn't have much of a personal life. His work is his everything. Damn, I could take that away from him at any time. A double wedding at the Pennington Mansion was the social event of the year in the old Florida town. Only 100 invitations were sent out. The Pennington and Murphy families were both respected in the area. Mrs. Faith Murphy looked up into her husband's face. Honey, we'll go outside so you can carry me over the threshold. No, my beautiful wife, I'm going to drag you upstairs and over the threshold into our quarters. If I have enough strength left after the wedding and reception, I think we need some sleep before we do anything else. Sleep? Yes, dear. We need sleep before we leave for our honeymoon in the morning. We don't want to start it tired, do we? Aha, here's our door. I think I can carry you across the threshold. Travis carefully picked her up, then slammed the door shut and carried her, throwing her onto the bed. They made love. Please be with me forever. I love you so much. And I love you too, my sweet wife. I really and truly love you. You are my life. Travis Murphy, my dear husband, I want you to know that I have never felt as loved and secure in my life as I do at this moment. I am content, satisfied, and absolutely and completely happy for the first time in my life. Darling, if this feeling ever leaves you, please let me know immediately. It is my life's purpose that you anywhere I felt the same way. I don't mean that I own or control you in any way. We will always be full partners in our future life together. The next morning, they boarded a Learjet 25D for a quick flight to New York. It was a double trip. Faith wanted Travis to meet her mother, who lived in town, and Travis wanted her to go shopping for a new wardrobe. Faith agreed to the shopping only if Travis would allow her to buy him a new wardrobe as well. Faith's mother was very beautiful at 47 years old. She looked much younger. She was an actress and model and divorced Faith's father when Faith was a teenager. Soon after, her father died and Faith lived with her grandparents in Florida. Faith's mother was delighted with Travis. They spent a couple of days together and she took them shopping. The return trip went smoothly and they were both glad to be home. The next day Travis had an appointment with Dr. Parnakar. He underwent a full medical examination and was found healthy enough for facial reconstruction. This was scheduled for next week. Travis and Faith returned to his office in the Pennington building. They arrived at his office via a private elevator. Travis told Sally that Faith would work with him whenever possible. Faith was wearing one of her new business suits and looked prim and proper. Faith waited until everything calmed down and some routine matters were sorted out. The CEO took on most of this work. Travis was assured that everything was going well. In the morning, Sally informed him about the general meeting. Faith then took Travis's hand, and they looked around all of Pennington's offices in the building. Faith knew almost everyone. They were all happy to see her. The girls teased her mercilessly. They wanted to know if they should bow when it passed. She said that they only had to bow if she spoke directly to them or otherwise acknowledged their humble presence. She even let a few kiss her sleeve. It was all in good spirit because they all loved Faith very much. They also visited Dr. Kanakar's office and several other offices on the lower floors. It seemed like everyone who worked in the building knew Faith and loved her very much. When they returned to his office, he sat down with Faith in a cozy area near one of the windows. From here, there was a beautiful view of the lake with the city in the background. Travis said, I love having you here with me. You're so much friendlier to everyone you meet that it makes my tougher appearance easier. I need your help. You know about the speech I have to give tomorrow morning. I want you to introduce me. Will you do this for me, please? Of course I'll do it, dear. I think you're right that I should do it. It should prepare you for a friendly audience from the start. I need to work on the introduction. I need a place to work. Travis walked over to his desk and pressed a button. Sally appeared a few seconds later. 
Yes, boss, how can I help you? Sally, we've decided that Faith will introduce me tomorrow morning. She wants to work on her speech. Can you help her, please? Yes, sir, we have a small office next to mine that she can use. It might be easier for her to dictate to me what she wants to say, and I will then formalize it. Then we can discuss it together. Wonderful, Travis said. He then added, Sally, I want this office to be remodeled with two equal-sized desks, one for Faith and one for me. I think you can help both of us. I want separate computer terminals for each desk. I, I want the computers to be connected, but able to work independently if necessary. Sally smiled and said it would be done by morning. Faith and Sally worked well together, and they were done within an hour. They didn't show it to me. The next morning the audience stood in anticipation as Faith, Sandy, Hank, and I walked on stage. Faith walked up to the podium and said, Good morning, Pennington Company. How are you feeling? For those who don't know me, I'm Faith Hall. Oops, I'm Faith Murphy now. Sorry, honey. She turned around and looked at me. We've only been married a week, she turned back to the audience. I've known my husband since school. When I first saw him, I told my friends that he was a very handsome guy. Now I know that he is really handsome. Let me tell you a little about him. He was born and raised here in Ocala, attended Mid-Florida Community College, then joined the Marines. He continued his education online, serving three tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. He earned business degrees, marketing, criminology, and, most importantly, cosmetology. Yes, you heard correctly, cosmetology. He has three purple hearts, one silver star, two bronze stars, and is currently recommended for the Congressional Medal of Honor, the highest honor our country bestows for heroism under fire. He still does. On active duty as a Marine captain while awaiting transfer to the Marine Corps Reserve for inactive duty. This is a truly wonderful person. He is kind, sweet, gentle, and loving. He is tough as nails and fearless in battle. He is very smart, but at the same time retains many boyish qualities. Forgive me if I seem biased. I can't help it. I love him with all my heart. Let me introduce you to my sweet husband, Captain Travis Pennington Murphy, United States Marine Corps. Travis walked up to her and kissed her, then turned to the audience. He looked at the crowd. Wow, I have absolutely no idea why I'm here. He turned and watched her walk back to the others on stage. He addressed the audience again. I would like to say a few words to try to explain to you who I am. My wife has probably already said everything that needs to be said. My uncle left me this company in his will. I've known about this for years and tried to prepare in my own way. I didn't try to learn this work specifically, but I tried to study to be an administrator capable of handling any circumstances that may arise. I did a lot of different jobs in the Marine Corps. They were all related to leadership, from assistant platoon leader, platoon leader, to company executive officer and company commander. I learned that one person cannot handle everything on his own. The only way for any leader to succeed is to delegate. I'm not sure yet if I want to be the president of this company. From the very beginning, when my uncle told me that I would inherit this company, he made it clear that this came with a huge responsibility. He told me this, you don't own all the people who work in the company. They own you because you are responsible for providing them with good, stable jobs. You are responsible for making sure these jobs are safe and provide the livability that Americans need, a decent wage that a person can live on and support a family with a good home. If you are unable to do this, be a man and admit it, and find someone who can manage it for you. You remain responsible for ensuring this is accomplished. Like I said, one person can't handle everything on their own. Every employee can help make sure this company remains profitable by doing their job the way they would want it done if they owned the company. If a person finds a better way to do their job, it is their responsibility to report it to their supervisor. If that manager does nothing about it, it is the employee's responsibility to leave a message in the suggestion box. Premiums will be paid for any offer that is used. He looked around the audience, then turned and beckoned Faith towards him. He again addressed the people sitting in the hall. 
I just wanted to make sure of the questions that you may have. Everyone applauded. One man behind said loudly, Sir, is your wife as hot as she looks? Travis looked at him and smiled. That's not exactly the type of question I had in mind. It's actually a lot more interesting than I expected. Let me put it this way, when that stern and no-nonsense woman comes home and changes into jeans or bikini, she's way hotter than you could imagine. That's why I look so tired all the time. Faith turned to him and pressed her face to his chest. The audience could see her shoulders shaking. Then she turned, and they realized it was laughing and not crying. She smiled. Girls, if I'm really hot this, she pointed at Travis, is what makes me so damn hot. The applause was accompanied by shouts and whistles. Travis raised his hands, and there was silence. Ladies and gentlemen, I must now introduce you to my sweet mama, Sandy Pennington Murphy Bradley, and her new husband, Colonel Hank Bradley. If you have any real problems, my door is not always open because my wife works next to me. Thank you all of you for your attention. Now get back to work. That evening, Travis and Faith were cozying up and watching TV when Travis turned down the volume and looked at his wife. Honey, what should I do about Alan Freed? Sandy says he doesn't have a love life, he doesn't date, and he doesn't have much. Friends, his work is his whole life. I can't destroy him because he was in love with you and tried to win you. He didn't act completely honestly, but you know, they say, all is fair in love and war. Trev, dear, I didn't know he treated me like that. He never asked me on a date. He was just always there and everything. Everyone thought he was a little weird. I actually thought he was in love with Nancy, my sister. Why don't you just let it go or maybe just talk to him? I'll think about it. Sally says his performance record is excellent. We'll see what happens next. Travis smiled. Now we are ready to answer any reasonable questions. Are you sure that you didn't even realize that he was so attached to you? Travis, my love, you may not believe it, and I don't mean to sound smug or vain, but most of the guys I see during the day are attracted to me. I don't really pay attention to it unless I'm very attracted to him myself. Guy. How many guys are you attracted to every day? Lately, my beloved, only one thing you. About. She looked and saw his wounded face, and tears flowed from her eyes. She noticed that his left eye was not completely closed. She froze. Honey, please close your eyes for a minute. They're closed right now, Faith. Why do you want me to close them? You knew that your left eyelid was not closing completely. No, I thought it closed completely, I think so. Travis felt a slight pressure on his left eyelid. The pressure pulled the eyelid down. He heard Faith whisper softly, It's closed now. Open your eyes and close them again. He saw Faith's beloved face with wrinkles between his eyebrows, then closed his eyes again. He heard her sweet, soft voice. Squeeze your eyes as tight as possible, dear. Fine. It stays open almost a quarter of an inch. I've never noticed that before. I wonder why. We should mention that to the doctors. Don't let me forget, okay? Love you, sugar. I hope you don't get away with it because my eye remains partially open when I sleep. What? I love you, all of you. It's even kind of cute, like you're spying on me while you sleep. Of course I'm peeking. When a man has a wife as stunningly beautiful as mine, it's wise to keep his eyes open at all times. I think I'll ask the doctors to make the other eye look the same. I need to keep an eye on you with both eyes. Faith laughed. You never have to worry about me, darling. I belong to you, body and soul. 